When we think about um, women's participation um, in peace and security, um, you know, we, we often ask the question, uh, how can we understand the lack of women's participation in peace and security? Um, and why are women so often absent or excluded uh, from the construction of peace? Uh, and I would I want to say that the answer to this question lies in a broader feminist political economy analysis of the gendered structural inequalities that underlie conflict and that are frequently restored and exacerbated after conflict in so-called peace. And that before I sort of go forward, I think it's really important for us to unpack what is participation, what, what, is, what does it mean? Um, a lot, a lot of the time uh, in the discussions about women, peace and security, we, we're discussing participation um, primarily as a kind of a form of political representation or presence in peace negotiations. Um, and, and that's definitely been the current focus of the U UN Women, Peace and Security agenda. Mm -hmm. But economic participation, social participation in post-conflict relief and recovery are also crucial, um, a crucial part of women's participation. Um, and without all forms of participation, I mean, we can, we can expect violence and conflict to recur. And I, I'm sure many of, many of you know that, um, you know, of the, of the cu current conflicts we have, I mean, 90% of them, 90% uh, of civil wars today are, you know, ca uh, being, you know, uh, carried out in, in contexts which have had a previous conflict. So there is this kind of cycle of violence and conflict. Um, so, so shifting our lens to not only thinking about this political sphere as if it's isolated from the economic realm and the social realm. And then secondly, how do we, how do we understand and define peace and security? I mean, th this is a big question and we all, you know, are trying to answer this. Um, but I think it's really important to understand peace and security not simply as the absence of war and conflict. Um, and, and, and to understand it not only in terms of the defence and the security institutions that provide protection, um, but also to un try to uh, understand the positive conditions for peace and security. And these positive conditions include economic stability and security, the full enjoyment of human rights, and that is economic and social rights, as well as political and civil rights for all groups. So just to broaden, just to you know, start with those assumptions, broaden our conceptualization and understanding, because very often in the debates we're having, we don't have this broad understanding. We're having this quite narrow understanding. So I really encourage you all to kind of, kind of question the, the question. So I just briefly tell you about just, uh, yes, yeah, so you know, and so we're asking where are the women? For those, this is the Dayton Peace Accord, you know, and I think it's really significant peace agreement because, of course, our conversations about women, peace and security very much took off um, from this peace agreement. And of course, no one raised the issue at that time that there were no women at the peace table. This was not a concern. Okay, so I just wanted to quickly, just briefly um, review the arguments that I've made in my work and just so I can build um, your understanding of why economic reform is a women, peace and security issue. So um, I, I wrote a book called The Political Economy of Violence Against Women and in that book um, I look at not only at conflict affected societies but argue that gendered structural inequalities underlie and fuel conflict but they're also exacerbated after conflict. And I think, I think we all know that conflict is, is uh, a gendered process. Um, and even though many scholars would argue, you know, that, that conflict results in disproportionate numbers of male battle deaths, as we call them, um, that actually if you look at the long-term effects of conflict, you actually see, you know, equal um, amount, you know, equal, you know, the indirect deaths from disease, displacement, poverty that ensue from conflict are disproportionately female. So actually, in the scheme of things, we need to understand conflict in a much longer time frame. Um, and, and a political economy perspective enables us to do that, um, to look at how war and conflict uh, really resh reshapes societies, um, but also has, you know, indirect impacts on the health, well-being, um, of, of women as well as men. Um, and then, I mean, most recently this year, we, with my colleague Aida Hozic, we uh, published a book with a number of contributors called Scandalous Economics. It's on the politics of financial crises, especially after the global financial crisis. 
And in this book, um, it's not so much about conflict, but in this book we argue that how financial capitalist crises enable extraordinary responses. The moment of crisis enables governments and elites and actors to do things that they couldn't do at a, at a time when there's more scrutiny over what they're doing. And this is exactly the same in security and conflict crises. So a conflict enables extraordinary responses. What actors can do in a conflict condition may be completely illegitimate. You know, and that, you know, they, they might sign, they might, uh, you know, sell off key assets of a country, right? During conflict, um, because they can, it goes under the radar, and yet that has, you know, long-term, ongoing consequences for the recovery of that society. So, and some people have referred to that as shock doctrine. Naomi Klein wrote a book called Shock Doctrine. Um, and other people talk about disaster capitalism, you know? And in a way, sometimes there's a creation of a crisis precisely in order to, to enact these changes, which you would not be able to do, you know, under, under kind of regular stable conditions where there's more kind of public scrutiny, international accountability, and so on. And in the book, we also argued that in this context of crisis, what comes very soon after crisis is austerity. Austerity programs of structural reform that, that seek to restore order, law and order, power and order. And what austerity does is that it actually ends up, you know, uh, blaming, blaming the, you know, not, not the, those culprits, but, you know, blaming victims. Um, and uh, uh, obfuscating, masking the actual material causes and consequences of crises, and uh, co-opting often inclusive discourses, um, of which gender is a part, um, you know, women's leadership and making it all look absolutely fine, but meanwhile actually ensuring that the power relations uh, you know, are reordered in a hierarchical way. And we can see this after the global financial crisis. I mean, we can see it in many countries in Europe. Um, the UK is a kind of, and Spain, Greece, these are kind of extreme examples of that. And uh, the third thing in scandalous economics, and I think it's very relevant to post-conflict, is that what we see uh, in crises, and even in financial crises, is that um, individual freedom, the freedom of the market, and militarization actually go hand in hand. So that what you have after conflict and even after is the power of the coercive state. It's an irony because we have this discourse about the free market and the free democracy, and yet um, we actually enable the powers of the coercive state um, to institute laws and rules um, and order. So it's really, and some colleagues of mine, you know, also talk about authoritarian neoliberalism to kind of capture that that paradox. So I think, I think the, the, the same kinds of patterns we can also see in post-conflict because post-conflict is also an extraordinary time. Okay, so let me move on then to talk just about, but come back to women, peace and security. And I'm going to talk about scandalous economics, the scandalous economics of post-conflict. Um, so in the Women, Peace and Security Agenda, I'm, I'm sure we all know since about 2010, um, the UN, UN has really referred to the four pillars of the agenda. So, you know, the prevention of conflict and women's roles in prevention, protection and especially gender sensitive protection of human rights that take into account, you know, uh, sexual and gender based uh, violence, crimes participation of women, the equal participation of women and men in peace and security processes and decisions. And finally, the fourth pillar, relief and recovery, uh, which is, I think, completely underappreciated and underrecognized in all of the uh, policy documents and, and, and resolutions from the Security Council that we have. Um, and so here, I mean, I think relief and recovery is ultimately about the political economy of post-conflict. Um, and I think it's very, very significant for women because it's women's economic and social rights that are really what makes it possible for them to participate politically. You, know, you can't have women's participation without those basic rights. And if you have relief and recovery programs that are re, you know, restructuring societies and actually undermining women's access to resources and economic and social rights, you can forget about participation in peace at the peace table. Um, okay, and I, I think that that's also generally because economic power under, underpins political power and is actually what leads to the concentration of power in society. Um, okay, so I mean, I think that here, if we look at 1325, um, you know, it's the evolution of, of our 
our movement and its association with this, this key resolution has been primarily informed by human rights law and addressed to security institutions rather than to economic and political institutions. And it's a kind of a, it's a, kind of a you know, systematic bias that we have in our institutions which reflect that liberal separation between politics and economics, between development and peace, um, you know, between security and development. Um, and uh, the problem with this is that 1325, even if it wasn't the intention of the activists who promoted this resolution, how it is then institutionalized, uh, it then ends up ne neglecting the structural inequalities that are root causes of gendered conflict. They're root causes of the gendered identities that kind of fuel and are mobilized in conflict uh, and that very much relate to that unequal power and that unequal access to resources um, that, uh, you know, that I think is a, is a kind of a, a material basis of gender differences and gender inequalities. Um, okay, so relief and recovery. Um, so in relief and recovery, I think, is really about the redistribution of resources and power in post-conflict transitions. Um, and what often happens in that redistribution is that we privilege armed roles. Um, and those who, who took up arms during conflict, we privilege ethnic, subnational, or religious identity groups. Um, and, and, and we actually fail to address gendered inequalities within those. And so, you know, you, it's, it's very, uh, you can see that in the way in which DDR programs, the security sector reform programs are structured, and the, the real challenges in kind of addressing the needs of female combatants or, um, or, or you know, um, display IDPs um, or just civilian victims of forced militarization and the ways in which reconstruction ends up privileging masculine sectors or male-dominated economic sectors and providing opportunities there and completely um, uh, you know, under-investing in social infrastructure and in economic sectors where women have, you know, um, historically, you know, dominated or um, been most present. So if we look at um, the most recent um, resolution on, in, from the U UN Security Council last year, 24-22, there's actually really no political economy analysis in that resolution. In our global study uh, on the implementation of 1325 last year, we have this statement, um, Economic recovery programs should target women's empowerment and initiatives to capitalise on the transformative role women can play in the economy and society in the future. Okay, it's not it's not rocket science. I mean, I think we can all agree with that. It's not that provocative. But what's really interesting is you don't have that language in 2242. It's not there. It's 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 evacuated. Um, so why, you know, and I think it's, uh, it's, it's a real concern for us, especially as we, you know, continue to see that divide between our, our, our economic diplomacy and our security diplomacy and our multilateral approaches that also separate out peace and development agendas. So, uh, you know, as a result, you know, there, there is, I mean, I think you can probably all speak to your own context and, 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 and have examples of the ways in which relief and recovery programs privilege veterans or former male combatants um, over, you know, citizens and, and sexual and gender-based violence survivors and so on. And I think this, this is really important to focus on because there is this broader, um, there's this broader hope about post-conflict that it could be a moment of social rupture that it could be a moment to reinvent social roles, power relations, gender relations. Um, and, you know, a lot of people would point to the case of Rwanda, for example, and they look at, you know, a large number of women in, in their parliament and say, well, Rwanda, look, you know, this is what you can do. Yes, it's what you can do when uh, so many men are killed in a genocide and women have to step up. I mean, it's, it's not... Um, it's not the kind of conditions we'd want to reproduce, is it? But actually, if we look at Rwanda, we look at Rwanda beyond what we can most visibly see, the numbers in the parliament, we can also see disproportionate poverty in female-headed households and the real challenges that um, women in that country have in sending their children to school and the ways in which ethnic inequalities and divisions get reproduced as a result of gender inequalities and gender divisions. Um, so let me just carry on here. I haven't really got too many more slides. And this one is the, those of you who speak uh, Bosnian, <laughs> no more peace. <laughs> uh, peace can be just as awful as war in this kind of context. 
Um, and I think that it's really important to know that really pretty much since the, the Bosnian conflict, we've had this notion of the liberal peace. And the liberal peace, um, as I mentioned before, is this notion that the surest foundation for peace um, within and between states is market democracy. And it's the idea that um, market democracy is the only possible way of organising a society. And that was, you know, associated... I don't know how many of you were, you look all, a lot younger than me, but in the 1990s, Francis Fukuyama wrote a book called The End of History, you know, as if liberal democracy is as good as it gets uh, in terms of human organisation. So that's really informed our notion of what we should do in post-conflict, create market democracies. And then we have peace building, which was also created in the 90s and, and is associated with the UN Secretary General, Beatrice Beatrice Ghali. And peace building is actually really, I mean, we all talk about it and we don't think what that is, but peace building is the notion that the use of military force goes hand in hand with the building of the liberal peace. Okay, so it's, it's you know, that we need the military force in order to create the market democracy. So I think it's, it's something that we can never just kind of fully embrace peace building. We have to actually transform what is a, fe a feminist understanding of peace building. Because peace building is by and large this notion of free elections, but controlled election outcomes, and usually without gender quotas, without any kinds of um, expectations that, that women would be, you know, present, uh, part of those electoral outcomes. I mean, or if we have quotas, you know, they, they, they are highly contested uh, and, and, and often undermined, even at the international level. We promote the economic reconstruction, but also the privatisation of state assets. That's, that's on the agenda, that's on the peace agreement, that's right there. And it might even be done during the war. And that has huge implications um, for societies. And I, I would argue it has particular implications for women. And we, we, we encourage state building, but also state shrinking, because we want to shrink those, those budgets, those public expenditures, that public finance, and those state employees. Um, and we have conditions on our international loans that are, that are, even if we have a positive condition about building up the, the education and health systems, you know, there's no, there, there's no, um, there's no follow through on that vis-a-vis um, -vis governments. And we argue uh, part of peace building is also creating uh, you know, uh, uh, the freedom of the media and the press, but also at the same time suppressing voices that we consider to be dangerous um, and strengthening civil society, but also strengthening law and order. So it's, you know, it's, there's two sides to it. It's, um, you know, there's, there's a dark side to peace building is what I'm saying. And that, <laughs> and, 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 and my colleague Aida Hosic has even said, well, you know, failed states are kind of like in the 19th century, the Victorian notion of fallen women, you know, that you, they need to be rescued and rehabilitated and brought back into the family to ensure the well-being of their neighbours and the broader community. They're an embarrassment to us. Um, and actually, it's, a, it's, it's, you know, I mean, it's a metaphor that's, you know, that's, that is under the surface, but it's, it's very much shaping our notion of peace, peace building. And so that it then enters the economic reform agenda and pretty consistent across the 20th century in economic reform after war is this, and, and this has been led by the international financial institutions, especially the IMF, is this notion that, um, and it's proposed by academics, economists, this notion that the path to redemption is defined by drastic cuts in public expenditure, especially social expenditure, fresh taxation, privatisation, labour flexibility, political independence of central banks so they can determine monetary policy without any scrutiny um, you know, or any political intervention, restriction of currency and restriction of credit. And international credit is only restored, only given, if all of these conditions are met. Okay, and that, that's actually after World War I, and that has not changed. And despite all the rhetoric of the IMF, despite the female head of the IMF who talks about, you know, women's economic empowerment, and, you know, that has not changed. There's more conditions on IMF loans now than, than ever previously. So, and that's after the global financial crisis. There's been a real upturn. Um, okay, so, and I, I mean, I could speak more to, to particular cases. I mean, I know quite a lot by now about the Bosnian Economic Reform Plan, which 
um, is all about fiscal consolidation. And fiscal consolidation is, this, again, this what I talked about, cuts in public budgets, privatization of health sector, um, and, and, and really trying to lower the cost of labor to, to attract foreign direct investment. And foreign direct investment, particularly into infrastructure areas where a lot of asset stripping can occur and profits can be made quite readily. Um, and all of that has to occur before you're going to get any reinvestment in social infrastructure, in education, training, um, you know, and, and, and uh, so on. And I think that what's really um, significant here is that fiscal consolidation has actually been shown by the IMF's own economists to not lead to growth. I mean, the idea here is that we need economic growth so we can actually provide the economic and social rights that actually we should be providing uh, to, to, uh, after conflict, you know, as, uh, at a minimum as compensation, but actually as a right, but also as compensation um, for uh, victims of war. Um, but uh, this all has to wait one or two generations until we've, uh, you know, we've, we've achieved economic growth. So, um, and I think um, the other uh, country that I, I've looked at, and it's a slightly different one, is Sri Lanka. And I know I don't think there's anybody from 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 Asia here. In the, is there anybody from Asia? Afghanistan? Are you from Afghanistan? Yeah. Also, where are you from? South Korea, great. Um, so I mean, Sri Lanka is a very interesting one, and it's not so much there about the IMF, but here you see also this notion of after war. I mean, even the the president Rajapaksa talked about, you know, now we've had uh, the people of Sri Lanka have had the victory in war. Now we need the victory, the economic war, <laughs> and he used the same kind of metaphors, and then brought in Chinese investment into infrastructure, and uh, to um, you know really built in the areas of sort of transport, uh, uh, construction and utilities, all sort of male dominated sectors. Meanwhile, the female dominated sectors, the garment industry um, and uh, uh, the agriculture areas actually had no subsidies, no, no support, and yet they, they've, re they've remained profitable primarily, by, primarily because of the low labour costs, the low labour costs of women's labour. Um, and at the same time, this kind of economic strategy has also gone hand in hand with continued militarization in the, in the Tamil minority areas of Sri Lanka in the north and east, where the military you know, is, is occupying power and the employer owns the farms, the shops, um, and you have really high uptake, uh, incidents of sexual abuse, sexual and gender-based violence um, after the conflict, you know, in part as a result of that. Uh, really skewed political economy. So there's a scandalous economics in post-conflict that we should all be on the lookout for and um, you know really it really doesn't look that different to the kind of um, scandalous economics we see after financial crisis or that we saw after the fall of communism in, in Eastern Europe and the former Soviet Union because the same kinds of policies are you know rolled out um, and what we know about these policies is that they have a disproportionate impact on women. Um, and what's of real concern is that there's no gender analysis or gender auditing of these policies. Um, and this is not something you can do after the fact. This is something that you actually have to have on the table before this economic reform agenda, before the economic plans are, are put in place. Um, and, you know, you, often, often then the question will be, you know, in, in many post-conflict countries is, you know, oh, why is women's formal economic participation in the labour market so low? You know, what can we do? If we only increase that participation, we could, we could have GDP growth once again. And so again, it's putting the burden back on women without any recognition of the kinds of roles and responsibilities that women have after conflict and helping their families and communities recover. Um, in the care economy, which is very significant and very large after conflict. So there's no taking into account of what I call the, the market economy is the sort of tip of the iceberg. The care economy is this massive economy it's a massive amount of economic activity that goes on, uh, you know, where people are kind of, you know, surviving, <laughs> caring for one another and, and recovering. And yet that activity and that, you know, that, that huge contribution to peace building is not really taken into account um, when these, uh, you know, formal economic plans are devised. And, uh, you know, even if we think about this sort of, one of the things of scandalous economics is the scandalous obfuscation of gendered impacts. So the policy reforms that are often designed by governments, often together with donor states, the international financial institutions, I mean, they actually, there is research showing they're linked, they are linked to poverty and inequality and adverse out health outcomes for children and for maternal mortality. 
So, I mean, th there is a good evidence base on this that we can bring to bear. Um, and so if I just kind of skip um, sort of to my conclusion, you know, like where, so, I mean, it's kind of a pessimistic story, I tell you, on the one hand, but I, I, I only emphasize that because I think we, we really do need a call to action. And, um, and, you know, rather than just focusing on women's participation in the armed forces and the security sector as the major operationalization of 1325, mm. I would argue we need to focus on women's huge contributions to relief and recovery in the, in the economy, in the society. And uh, we need to challenge neoliberal uh, post-conflict economic reforms because they, argue, they, they exacerbate the conditions for gendered violence. They are associated with the increases in many of the direct and indirect risk factors for violence. So unequal power, financial stress, economic instability, unemployment, lack of services, men's risky behaviours, suicide, alcoholism, drug taking, all of these things are risk factors for, you know, for gender-based violence. Um, and you know, we at, at the same time, they're all major constraints and major barriers to women's full participation uh, in post-conflict societies. So I, I would argue that the economic reforms that we've seen in post-conflict countries uh, reinforce inequality, but they also, more importantly, promote the acceptance of a continuum of structural and gendered violence in an increasingly militarised and globalised order. So what can we do? I, I don't think that we have seen the social rupture and we should be able to see social rupture in post-conflict. We should be able to work toward that. So if we uh, are being focused on women's representation at the peace table in the peace process, let's move beyond just talking about women's bodies at the peace table, women's descriptive representation. Let's actually talk about the substantive agendas that women can bring to the peace table that will actually enable greater social and economic equality and that will actually address endemic violence, normal, the normalisation of violence across society. And I think there are a lot of things that we can do there. Um, I've, I've got, um, you know, a lot, uh, you know, uh, quite a lot of ideas here, and there are a lot of measures um, that that are op that are open um, to uh, to groups, to governments, and, and to the international community, and even uh, in the context of Sweden's feminist foreign policy. Um, and I, I'm happy to say some more about what I think about the the, the goals of Swedish feminist foreign policy. <laughs> but um, I, I'll just I'll try to just quickly finish. So I think that we could have women's rights audits of international financial agreements. We could have all all and, and all economic recovery plans. Um, we need a massive capacity building of women's rights activists and women across all economic sectors. And I, I, I mentioned yesterday in an interview with Swedish Radio. I think what we need is a feminist Marshall Plan that harness. <laughs> that harnesses the strengths of the diaspora from many conflict countries and actually you know, twins them, partners them, builds up their capacities in different sectors with the aim of sending them back to, to, to build back better. Um, you know, take the, take the strengths from the societies, the more stable societies. None of them have got it right, but taken together, they all, ha they all do things uh, differently and they have strengths and w we can learn from that. Um, and if we had the kind of massive investment in human capacity that we had after World War II, you know, between the United States and Europe and Japan, and we had that um, with respect uh, to women, uh, we, we, can, we could expect a very different uh, post-conflict post um, uh, peace. Um, and so I, I think, um, you know, this is, this is a this is looking forward, um, but I think that, you know, what we can learn from, from you know, very recent experiences is that you know you've got to put these these issues have to be on on the table um, and there's a lot of potential here um, to 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 mobilize and to harness the the moment of post conflict um, to transform gender relations and to end violence so I, 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 I haven't been very succinct we have 20 minutes though <laughs> thank you thank you so much Jackie let's Much information and many things to. Yes, we. <laughs> I, I will do like this. We'll take like two or three questions and then let Jackie um, respond to them, and then we will have another session. So, just a moment. Yes. <laughs> We're filming this session because we want oh, to be able to that. show it to those who are not able to come here today, and also save for later. Uh, good morning, my name is uh, Nada, I'm from Jordan. Uh, thank you very much for uh, 
focusing on this fourth pillar. I'm from the Middle East, from Jordan. Just, okay. just a little, not, not too close. Yeah. Um, yeah, I just would want to thank the professor for this interesting session and for focusing on this fourth pillar of the UN Security Council uh, Resolution 1325. Because to be honest, in our country, we usually you know, focus on the first two pillars, which is prevention and protection, but not that relief, recovery, and political economy. But my question is, if we are going to do some advocacy work in our country towards the government, uh, because we're having few women uh, participating in peacekeeping forces, uh, across many countries. So if we are going to do some advocacy work around that, uh, let's say women's role in peacekeeping uh, forces and how it can influence this relief and recovery element, uh, what do you think our argument would be or how can we work on that uh, topic? Thank you. That's a great point. I'll take uh, two more questions. Thank you. This is really wonderful to learn and know a lot many new things, especially with the perspective of Asia. And my name is Pervez Tafel. I'm from Swedish Committee for Afghanistan, and I'm based in Kabul. And I'm pretty new here to know and understand what's happening in Sweden with regards to gender mainstreaming. And first of all, I just want to share an observation. I'm the only man in this gathering. Mm -hmm. <laughs> And this is one of uh, my observation as well. Whenever we discuss about gender equality, we might miss the role of men in all this debate. And whenever we discuss about gender equality, thing, there are different perspectives of thinking men's active role. And I personally feel like until and unless men are not engaged, they are not sensitized, they are not trained with regards to women participation <coughs> in all political process, we might not be able to achieve that equality perspective. And as you discussed, like if we see the gender dynamics, political power, we see all men are at the leading positions. And I, I personally feel like men should also be trained with regards to understanding women participation process, particularly the meaningful participation. As you discussed Rwanda, we have good number of women even in Pakistan, we have 33% of women in parliament, but unfortunately, they are controlled. They are representing men, rather they are representing themselves. Mm -hmm. So I, I just want to have your perspective on that, how we can facilitate men engagement in this all process through women activism, mm -hmm. and how women activism can facilitate to bridging the gap in between men and women so they can both work together. Mm, Thank you. Question. I will actually have the third question myself, and then I will <laughs> let you <laughs> uh, respond, and, and then we will open again. I was, I was just um, wanted to um, ask you to, as you, you said, you had some reflection on the f feminist foreign policy, and also we know that Sweden will now take a seat in the Security mm. Council from January. So I wonder if you have any suggestions, or what you think would be good for Sweden to push for when they have when we have our seat and yeah. actually what we should ask Sweden to do during their two years in the Security Council. So that's my question and then we will have another round. Great, great questions. Th thank you all. Um, I might start with, uh, was it N N Nada. Nada. Nada from Jordan. Thank you so much for your question. Um, I know a little bit about Jordan because I had a student do her master's thesis on it and I have visited Jordan so and I know that there's quite a lot of initiatives around women's economic empowerment but that they, they, they tend to reinforce gender stereotypes and they're primarily in quite feminized areas but there is there, there is a focus somewhat of a focus including on women's entrepreneurship so I mean I think it's a huge opportunity you know to have women in the security sector and what I would first say is that is a political economy issue as well. You know, if you open up the security sector to women, that's actually a job. You can actually be trained in that way. So that's actually a whole part of the post-conflict economy that you definitely want for women, not just because, because it, um, you know, it, women so-called might be better at providing security or better at communicating with female, you know, civilians. 
um, so it's an operationally, uh, you know, achieves operational goals. Um, but actually, it means that, you know, the employment opportunities in the post-conflict moment are actually equally open to men and women. And I think we've seen that in Liberia. That's, that's, you have more younger women, you know, kind of going into the security sector as a result of the first female police unit that was positioned in Liberia from, from India. So, you know, don't underestimate the relief and recovery initiative in itself of having women peacekeepers. Um, and the fact that that will open up the broader security sector, you know, in terms of it'll, it'll show that actually women can actually have the capacity to work in that, in the security sector, which is a key economic sector. But also they, they can be huge agents for economic recovery, I think. I think there's a huge amount of potential there. Um, and, and, and it's possible, you know, trying to identify what are some of the barriers and constraints for, for women's, you know, um, economic activities beyond the household. Um, whether that's, you know, informal market activities or, you know, um, empl you know the, the kinds of safety and security concerns they have about traveling to work or, you know, seeking employment. I mean, those are, those are very real security issues that, that, that should be, you know, sh could be addressed and could be raised by, um, by, by women uh, who are involved in peacekeeping operations. Um, you know, really seeing their role as, as facilitating and enabling the safety and security of women, women workers and women's mobility beyond, you know, beyond the, the household, beyond the camp, um, wherever it is. Um, so I, th I think, it, and I think, you know, as a start, I mean, this whole notion that, um, that, that why we, you know, that the argument made why we need more female peacekeepers because we, we are actually going to be able to, you know, uh, achieve protection for, for all of society better is that, you know, it's an opportunity also to open up a conversation between those peacekeepers and women in the community about their, safe, their safety and security needs. Um, and that would include economic security. And, I, and I, Because I think many times women encounter violence when they are, you know, trying to seek access to resources or employment, uh, you know, water, food, all of these things, you know, that's when they encounter violence. I mean, it's not, they intentionally go to these places where they're more vulnerable. They have to go there, you know, to procure, um, you know, basic needs uh, for their families. So I, th I, th I, think, I think that, you know, I think it's very possible to make those connections. And I think that would be a huge innovation if you could do that in Jordan, because you actually already have a bit of a foundation of, you know, of, of focusing on women's economic empowerment. And on that, I would also just say that next year in, um, at the Commission on the Status of Women in the UN, the focus is on women's economic empowerment. So just maybe just to link back to the Swedish feminist foreign policy, okay, let's actually see an explicit link between the, <laughs> that, that focus for 2017 on women's economic empowerment and the women, peace and security agenda. Let's actually elevate that issue within the women, peace and security agenda and let's elevate it through the relief and recovery pillar. And let's actually talk not just about, you know, entrepreneurship and micro enterprise. Let's actually talk about gender sensitive economic recovery, economic plans, economic decision making. Let's actually talk about, you know, a greater policy space for women to be able to actually contribute to those, those decisions at that very crucial point. And let's talk about a feminist Marshall Plan to build the capacity uh, for, for, for women's organisations on economic policy making. Um, so I, that's what I would say. I think that's enough. I think you know. If I think I think uh, I, I think if Sweden could run with that, that'd be fantastic, and we'd we'd all be we'd all be supporting them. Yeah. Um, I, and 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 thank thank. I didn't catch your name. Pervis. 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 Thank you very much for your question. And what a brave question. I mean, I know what it's like to be the only woman in a room of men, <laughs> and in my life, and I always found it really hard to speak up. But I forced myself, and I remember my heart bumping, and how hard it is. So, I mean, I don't, you know, I think it's very significant to raise the issues around men, and um, you know, women and men's partnership for gender equality. Um, I think it's it's incredibly important. And what I would say is, I. You know, I, I've seen some um, uh, really recent s significant examples of this um, in research I've been doing on women's prevention roles, women's prevention roles in countering violent extremism in Indonesia. And there you see a really uh, strong movement of men Islamic scholars and leaders supporting women's religious leadership. And why are they supporting it? because they believe gender equality is crucial to promoting a culture of peace and tolerance. 
Um, but I, I, I think that was, for me, that was so powerful that they, they had knowledge and they had access to power and they actually not only were sharing that with women, but they were actually deliberately trying to empower those women because they share this, they share this broader goal of a tolerant Islam. And I, so I think that, you know, maybe we need to think about, you know, gender equality is not an, is an end, it's an important end. But is, we also believe that gender equality is an important means to, you know, to peace and security. And I mean, sometimes some of those of us don't, don't like, you know, we, you know, we don't like the idea of gender equality being sort of just, you know, an, um, you know, an, an, an instrumental way of getting to peace development. But it actually is. Um, and you know, men are invested in those those end goals too. Um, and and so I think, um, I, and I, I think that if within our own local societies and cultures we're able to make that argument that, you know, if men and women can kind of share a vision and um, and you know, it's, you know, it's kind of um, support and empower one another and open up the range of roles that are possible for them, um, then, then we you know then we we can actually address those highly gendered identities where men are expected to fight, men are expected to take up arms, men are expected to be manly, men are expected to be breadwinners. Well, no, men don't have to do all of that and we certainly, we don't need the arms part at all. <laughs> you know, and that we can all be breadwinners, we can all contribute and we can all enable one, each other to, you know, to, to, you know, to, um, you know, maximise our human potential and capacity and that's actually going to get us and, and it's so important in a post-conflict developing society because we don't want to wait three generations do we <laughs> we want we want to go a little bit quicker and so we need all you know all hands to the deck we need men and women to help us get where we want to get and we will get there much much more efficiently if we work together so and I'm sure I mean so I think I think that I think that we we, we we need to make the arguments and we need to explicitly partner with men and I think there are good ex I think we have some good examples of that already um, and you know we, we can learn from those and just you know I, I just really have my mind blown in Indonesia I I came away with a whole stack of books on feminist Islam written by men um, which you know you know and partnering with women which I, I think is fantastic so um, you know, so beyond what I thought w was possible in a, you know, in, in a Muslim majority society. Um, but I understand that's a specific, con a very large country, but that's a specific context and every society has, you know, ha has, to, has to develop their own, their own partnership. Thank you. <coughs> yes. Yeah. Oh, woman here. Thank you. I will speak in French if someone understands me. You can introduce yourself. Also. You can translate for me. Who would like to translate? Okay. <laughs> uh. <laughs> bon, nous sommes dans dans les contextes congolais et en RDC, il y a plusieurs plusieurs difficultés, plusieurs problèmes qui bloquent l'empoignement de la femme l'employment économique de la femme. So we are in the Congolese context and there are many factors that block uh, economic empowerment of women. I'm Eugenie Katagata from uh, DRC. Okay. Thank you, Susanna. Uh, mais d'autre côté, on sait aussi que uh, l'absence de l'absence de, de la pauvreté économique de la femme bloque cette femme à la participation au processus de paix. This economic uh, poverty blocks the women to participate in the process of peace to build peace. Maintenant ma question est de savoir dans dans ces conditions là Comment est-ce que on peut promouvoir l'employment économique de la femme et sous quel angle? In these kind of conditions, how can we promote women's economic empowerment uh, and from which angle? Thank you. So what to I do? Will take a few more questions. Please start this one. 
Um, I think my question is maybe a, a little bit similar to the one from Eugenie. Uh, uh, my, my name is Disa. I'm a policy advisor here at Kvinna Kvinna. Uh, I think my question is a little bit similar to the one from Eugenie. And it's about uh, strategy. Um, as you said, within the Women, Peace and Security agenda, it's a, a quite a limited space to address these issues. And one of the conclusions from the global study that came out last year was the growing political commitment that is not accompanied by an economic commitment and, and financing of the agenda. And that's uh, a, a huge gap uh, that we see. And uh, Kvinna Tekvinna has been part of calling for financing of the agenda. Um, but I uh, completely agree with you on this separation of, of bodies within the Women, Peace and Security agenda. We, we address uh, security institutions um, and peace institutions. Mm -hmm. But what are the entry points to address mm -hmm. the political economy institutions um, and to use the Women, Peace and Security agenda within those Mm. Uh, um, institutions or as, as a means uh, to raise these issues. Mm. So if you could uh, maybe develop your idea of the feminist Marshall Plan. <laughs> <laughs> so we have one more and then I will let you uh, conclude or respond. No, I, I just wanted to ask you to reflect on the Swedish feminist <laughs> policy. A you met, yeah, a little bit more. Thanks. Great. Th thank you so much for your questions. Um, uh, I, my colleague from the, the Congo, what's your first name? Eugenie. Eugenie. Eugenie, Eugenie, Eugenie like Eugenie, Eugenie. Okay. Thank you so much. Um, yes, of course. And I understand that, you know, uh, the kind of comments I made very much fit the, the context of, of the Congo. So what could you do? <laughs> um, and that's always a hard thing for an academic, but I do think this. <laughs> and you, you guys are always asking that question. <laughs> I know. <laughs> um, we're very good at critique, but <laughs> um, I think that it's um, you know a kind of about a gender balanced investment uh, approach to post conflict relief and recovery. So first of all, what ne needs to be done um, by governments, donors, is a mapping of the economic activity, a full mapping, you know, of the care economy, the remittance economy, the market economy, the, the underground economy. Um, and then I think we need a gender balanced investment. So not only do we need to be looking at economic growth through foreign direct investment in, you know, infrastructure like roads and construction and, and you know, uh, you know you, you, the commanding heights of the economy, the utilities. and the water and uh, electricity and so on. But we need to, we need to look for an investment in social infrastructure, um, in education and health systems. And by the way, those are the areas where you'll see women most likely to be employed. So whilst we want to change the world and change the fact that you know, women tend to be in these kind of feminized areas, you know, that more, you know, you can see it in Sweden, right? I mean, Sweden is, is a great example because, you know, the public sector is disproportionately female and the private sector is disproportionately male and the private sector is also linked to the export sector and the foreign, okay, the, the global economy. So this is some, this is a, this is a pattern even in the so-called gender equality equal <laughs> society. So we're not going to change that overnight, but if we actually invest in those feminized areas, they actually become more attractive for men as well, right? So I think that we've got to provide invest social investment in social infrastructure, investment in early childhood education. I, I said this is a very counterintuitive thing, but actually I think it's hugely important in a post-conflict society, investing in the youngest children. And that is, uh, that's an opportunity to remake society, to tell the story, the values, the norms that we want the next generation to grow up with. And women are really well placed to work in that sector, especially if that's a sector that's equally valued, you know, that receives, you know, you know, remuneration that really recognises that really important educational, caring work. 
Um, and, and, and I think, you know, that when you open up that sector and you and publicly invest in it... You open up opportunities for women, you open up... In the, and actually men start to want to work in it too. Um, and, and, you know, you revalue the feminised areas of work and you revalue the, you know, the work of rebuilding societies, which is actually about rebuilding human relations. So I think that you know, we, we, we've got to push for, we can't wait for social investment. We can't wait for investment in those areas uh, until we've you know, had you know, achieved kind of economic growth. We actually need it now. And actually, if we, do, um, you know, if we do the analysis of say military expenditures, I mean, one of the things we know from CIPRI right, right here in mm -hmm. Stockholm is that um, the, the economic gains or spillover effects from, mil from investing in arms is actually very limited in terms of employment in the economy. Okay? Investing in education and health <coughs> has a huge spillover effect across the entire economy. So it actually, I mean, the people in the, who do the Global Peace Index know this. It's a really important condition for positive peace. And there are, you know, it has a broader impact on economic growth, a much bigger impact on growth real security expenditures. So I mean, I guess that's just one thing I would leave you with. I mean, obviously it's a big question you ask. <laughs> um, and you asked it. Um, it. Question DISA, I mean really it's not uh, along the same lines. Um, I think that now, I mean first of all, I mean I think it's really important. I, I also like the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom new campaign on, on money as power. You know, like putting the money behind peace, mm -hmm. not behind war. Um, and I think, you know, look at how much we spend on, you know, on arms, but look at how much we spend on responding to conflict and emergencies, and look at the limited amount we spend on prevention, and actually trying to build up that positive peace so we don't actually. So, I mean, this, this is really important advocacy, and I think that we need to see mu many, even in the existing security apparatus, the peace apparatus, we need to see actual targets on on spending. So we've got that new target on in peace building, the peace building fund, 15% must go to um, gender equality initiatives. Okay, right, let's start, let's start pushing for that in every area. I actually just wrote a report for, and it will, for UN Women Asia Pacific, um, and it's on the emerging issues in the women, peace and security agenda and national action plans. And I was able to, with them, write some recommendations. So I've written recommendations on targets for spending in the counter-terrorism and countering violent extremism. Money must be tagged for gender equality. All of these other agendas that are cross-cutting and also linked to women, peace and security must have targets for spending on gender equality. And then, you know, I so see that that's one thing. But then I actually think that we need, um, after war, we need specific investment from the internet. We need specific loans. Loans should be positively conditional on meeting gender targets. Let's actually see some positive conditionalities. Not the ones, you know, not the negative conditionalities, but let's say countries actually get a lower interest rate. Some economic incentives for meeting gender equality goals. And let's actually see also some specific investment that is targeted as compensation, uh, you know, for, you know, for women victims. Uh, and, and uh, you know, civilian victims of war. And, and that can be in the form of some kind of collective reparations that can be funded by donor, donor states. So that goes into this social investment, goes into this investment in social in infrastructure. Um, uh, the kinds of projects that I, that, I, that I mentioned, where you would see a real boon for, you know, for women's employment, women's economic empowerment. Um, and I think, you know, the Feminist Marshall Plan is something about, you know, Bill, I mean, it is re relevant because that's about an exchange of the civil services of countries, the public sectors of countries, the policy makers, the policy analysts, the economic analysts. I mean, that's the card, that's an important cadre, that's an important intergovernmental network that can support one another in, in the rebuilding um, of societies. And you need strong, you need strong developmental states after conflict. And that means that you need, you know, a really, you know, you need, you know, significant investment, not just a cutting of public service and public budgets. You need a reinvestment and really, um, uh, what would you say, it? Um, in, in civil services that can deliver public value. And, you know, there's a whole literature on this, you know, public value thing. And, and we need to bring that to bear on post-conflict societies. 
Um, and because I, I think that it, it, and it's it's a lot about you know it is about you know the fact that 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 many of these societies have had entrenched gender inequalities and, and women often don't have not had the training and education and opportunities um, to be able to participate in decision making. Um, and that, they, that, that means that in Afghanistan, for example, you know, that 33%, you know, uh, are following other agendas because they don't have, a, you know, don't have access to, other, you know, they haven't had the opportunity to, you know, to, um, to learn about other agendas and, and which, which m might better reflect um, the needs and the interests of, of society. Uh, and last question, I think, rest in on feminist foreign policy. I mean, there's six goals, right, in the Swedish feminist foreign policy. It's a little bit like the four pillars, but it's a few more. Okay, we've got to have an integrated agenda. And we've got to understand how protecting women's rights relates to women's economic empowerment, relates to women's participation in peace. We've got to connect these. So, we've, and, and, we, and you, in NGOs, you talk about a theory of change. Okay, there's no, in an academic, we talk about a causal kind of analysis or mechanisms. That's not in the Swedish feminist foreign policy at present. <laughs> what comes first? You know, what's the priorities and how are they connected? Um, and, and what's the bottom line? So I think um, what I would argue is that these are not separate. We, we must not separate out women's rights from economic empowerment from women's participation. These are actually... You know, uh, 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 you know, they, you know, I would, I would argue that, you know, social and economic rights for women are, are absolutely essential to, to, to achieve economic empowerment or participation um, and protection. And what we know also is that women, when women have access to, to income, to property or income generating property or their own home, some kind of resource, they're, they're far less likely to be vulnerable to violence. Okay, they're more able to protect themselves. They they have greater bargaining power. So this is actually you know and 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 then you know and and even in, in programs where you see this this focus on 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 social and economic rights that you, you know you you can also understand having that base that you may actually you know you, you give women also the possibility to think about um, you know I think about shaping their societies, participating in the in the political sphere. Thank you so much.